So what I'd like to talk about is uh, to share some of my work and reflections from the past year and a half, um, working in various shapes and forms, supporting um, governments, supporting global health uh, agencies and uh, manufacturers around the world on COVID-19 vaccines, both the research and development of those vaccines and the distribution. So I thought what we could do is organize this um, discussion into three parts. Give me a second to advance my slides. They were stuck. Um, so, so three main topics. First, I'd like to share some reflections on vaccine research and development, both to reflect on the tremendous accomplishments of the past year and a half, and also the very significant unfinished agenda that we have in vaccine development. The second is to talk about vaccination rollout. I'm sure we read in the news every day about vaccines, variants, progress, hesitancy. Um, I'd like to share some reflections on how the rollout is going, what are the key bottlenecks that countries are facing, what have we learned, how are countries overcoming those bottlenecks, um, and what really still needs to be done as we watch this race play out between vaccines and variants. And then third, I'd like to reflect on the global inequity that we're observing as vaccines are rolled out around the world. Um, and really the fact that this is the single biggest barrier to ending the pandemic. So both to acknowledge the problem and then share some reflections about what can be done to address it. After each of these sections, I'll share um, a few slides and, and some reflections and then I'll pause for um, Q&A would really love to hear your questions and make this as interactive as possible. So first let's talk about research and development. It's really just, every time I look at this slide, I just, uh, I'm amazed by what our research and development community has been able to achieve with COVID-19 vaccination, where we have dramatically compress the timelines for vaccine development. And this slide actually doesn't even do it justice um, because the typical timeline, this sort of shows five years plus plus. You know, in reality, the typical timeline for vaccine development is more on the order of 10 to 15 years. And the global community was able to compress that to under a year. Um, and the way that was done, it's really important to recognize, was not by skipping steps. Um, there's a standard development process that's very meticulous in terms of developing a vaccine construct and then testing it first in small populations and then in ever larger populations, first looking purely at safety and then along the way looking at efficacy as well. And none of these steps were skipped. But what we were able to do is do a lot more things in parallel that are typically done sequentially. And that was made possible by two main factors. One is um, typically vaccines are made by companies um, who, who have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. So that means they have to be really conscious about how much they're spending on development. And so they're very careful to do one step before they pay to go on to the next step, to go pay on to the next step. But this is where governments were able to come in and help fund manufacturers to be able to do more things in parallel. So that allowed them to take on more risk. And also regulators recognizing the crisis situation that we were in also were able to do things faster in terms of approval timelines and in terms of allowing all these steps to go in parallel. And this is just a tremendous accomplishment that, um, that really gets me very excited, not just because of the implications it's had on our fight against COVID, but also because now there's an opportunity to turn and look at all the other vaccines that we're trying to develop. And if there's one thing that I hope you get excited about in this presentation as you think about your future careers is, you know, what about malaria vaccines? What about HIV vaccines? What about universal flu vaccines? There's so many different diseases for which uh, we don't yet have vaccines that could be so impactful. And if we think about 
taking all the innovation and the lessons learned from this experience and applying them to the broader portfolio, there's an opportunity for really tremendous health impact. So that was how the vaccines were developed. We now have roughly, depending on how you count, 14 vaccines that have been approved for some form of use around the world by different regulatory agencies. And about half of those um, have approval from the World Health Organization, uh, which means we have quite a, a powerful arsenal of tools as we think about COVID, uh, combating COVID-19 around the world. And you've probably seen that slide had some data points. This slide has some data points, but lots of numbers flying around in terms of how well do these vaccines work? What's their efficacy? What's their efficacy against different variants? Um, and, and all of that can be a bit confusing sometimes. So this slide just tries to lay out when we talk about efficacy, what do we mean? We have to be really clear, efficacy against what? The vaccine is protecting you against what? There are different ways you can measure that. One is how well does it protect against severe disease? How often do people who have been vaccinated end up with a case of COVID-19 that requires hospitalization um, or causes death? versus how well do vaccines work against symptomatic infection, which means if you're vaccinated, what's the, what's the chance that um, you might be infected and have any form of symptoms, versus what's the impact on transmission, which means if you're vaccinated, what's the chance that you get infected, whether or not you have, have symptoms. And so most of the data um, points that came out of the clinical trials we're really measuring symptomatic disease. So what's the chance, you know, when Pfizer had its first press release and it was the first that said its vaccine is 91% effective, what that means is it prevented 91% of the people in the trials from getting any form of symptomatic disease. Um, and those numbers, these numbers keep on coming out. They also change as we get new variants of the disease. Um, but one of the really headline messages that is still remaining consistent um, and is cause for great optimism is this top row, which explains that vaccines protect extremely well against severe disease, um, which ultimately you know, is, is the most important health outcome that we care about. And this that I'm showing you right now is clinical trial data. What we now have also as countries have been rolling out vaccines around the world is we have increasing real world evidence. Um, and this is another place where um, the, the COVID-19 vaccine experience has unlocked a lot of opportunity in better using real world data in addition to clinical data to understand how well vaccines work and how they can be used in different um, population. So this is the data from some of the countries that were fastest in getting vaccines to large percentages of their population, the UK, the US, and Israel. And what we see is basically the blue lines on this chart are cases um, of, of COVID-19, and the gray line represents vaccination coverage. And as the coverage got roughly past the 50% mark, that's where we started to see really significant drops in, in numbers of cases, um, which tell us that you know, vaccines are an extremely powerful tool, which when deployed in combination with other measures like testing and social distancing, really do give us the ability to bring this pandemic to an end. So that's the good news. The bad news, which is all over the news these days, is variants, which is we really are in a race, which is the faster we can vaccinate the world, we can bring down transmission of the disease and we can protect people that are most vulnerable to severe disease and death. But the longer we delay in getting that broad vaccination coverage, we allow for transmission that creates breeding grounds for new variants. And when you have new variants, we've seen they spread very rapidly around the world and they um, have the potential to undermine vaccine effectiveness. 
so far, even against variants, the vaccines appear to be holding up pretty well against severe disease and death. But in terms of prevention of symptomatic infection, in terms of prevention of transmission, um, they are less effective. So we have this, this race that's playing out in real time, which is the faster we can get vaccines to the world, the less transmission there is, the less transmission there is, the less risk of propagating new variants. And the last thing I'll say um, on vaccine R&D, and then I'll pause for a first round of questions because this is a lot of information to cover, is that we're not done on research and development of COVID-19 vaccines. There's so much innovation that continues and, and needs to continue. When I showed you that first slide of how the development was done, we didn't skip any of the critical steps related to evaluating vaccine efficacy and um, safety. Those were sort of, you have to do all the steps that one would normally do to evaluate those, but there were corners cut in other areas. For instance, um, dosing, what's the optimal dosing regimen? Does it work better if you get two doses four weeks apart or does it work better if you get doses 12 weeks apart? Or this question of mixing, if I got a Pfizer vaccine, can I then get a Moderna vaccine or a J&J &J vaccine? Or shelf life, so um, in order to know if a vaccine remains stable in a refrigerator for six months, you have to study it for six months. And so there was such a rush to get these vaccines out there that a lot of these questions um, are still being asked in parallel with the um, with the vaccine rollout, and they're giving us really valuable additional information and ways to use the vaccine at pediatric vaccination. Right, we started by vaccines that were approved for 18 years old, and now it's been dropped down to 12. And now the manufacturers are studying even younger ages, um, or the extension of J and J's shelf life from three to four and a half months was quite significant to give us longer to use the vaccines that we have in the U.S. Uh, so those are just a few examples of the research that um, is continuing to progress in parallel with the vaccine rollout. And it's a really important innovation agenda, both for our current campaign, but also again, allows us to learn things that then can be applied more broadly for COVID-19 vaccines in the future, as well as, as many other um, vaccines. So let me stop there. Um, I'm going to turn after this from research and development to deployment. Once we have the vaccines, how do we deliver them? How do we distribute them around the world as quickly and equitably as possible? Uh, but happy to take any questions first on research and development. Vivian, go ahead. I was just wondering, like, what is your academic background and how did you get introduced to consulting? Because I don't know too much about consulting. Sure, happy to, happy to speak to that. That's a great question. And I probably should have given that context up front before diving into some of this content. Um, so my academic background is actually, I have two history degrees, um, but that masks, I was saying earlier, I started college as a biology major. Um, and then had a change of heart my senior year and finished with a history degree. Um, but I was always very interested in healthcare and knew I wanted to work in the healthcare industry in some form. Um, and that my journey started looking more at um, working in labs, um, interning in hospitals, thinking I'd be a bench scientist or a doctor. Uh, but then I got really interested in public health and more at the intersection of science and policy and social and economic determinants of health. Um, so my graduate school research was more on the um, economic and social underpinnings of healthcare. And with that, I, I got into consulting really because it was an opportunity to explore multiple different um, industries and companies, uh, consulting firms like BCG, what we do is we serve um, organizations that include 
private companies, governments, philanthropic organizations on um, a wide variety of topics related to management questions. How do I invest my scarce resources? How do I effectively form partnerships? How do I implement really ambitious programs? Um, so it's a wide range of questions. Um, and so I came to the job with a passion for healthcare and really um, learned along the way. Uh, and my expertise in vaccines, I built up by serving uh, pharmaceutical companies who make vaccines, as well as global health organizations uh, that fund vaccine research and also make policy uh, decisions around uh, investments in, in vaccine deployment and design of, of strategies to effectively deploy vaccines. I sort of picked vaccines for two reasons. One, um, it, it really excited me and I just had a lot of passion about working in an area and on products that help people not get sick. Um, and also it's an area where there's a lot of public private collaboration. Uh, and I really enjoyed being able to work with both the private sector and the public sector and have sort of one foot in both worlds rather than having to choose one or the other. Tommy, go ahead. Um, I would like to ask which methods do you use to determine the effectiveness of a vaccine? Sure, great. So the way vaccine development works, um, it is, is there, there's sort of typically um, four or five steps you can think about. So the first is designing a vaccine construct where you're trying to, um, there are different technologies to do this, where you present um, a safe version of part or all of the virus to the body, you introduce it to your immune system in order to generate an immune response so that when you're exposed to the not safe form of the virus, your body is already primed to respond. And so the first step is designing that construct and testing it um, in, um, in a lab uh, outside of, of humans in vitro, and then sometimes also in animals to understand uh, initially, you know, do we think this will be safe? And do we have a sense that it generates that it's effective and the effectiveness is measured by does it generate an immune response? And then there's phases of human testing where you go from a first phase with a very small number of people where you're looking at safety. Uh, if I give this to a small number of volunteers, do I see any concerning um, side effects? Then the second phase is you look, you always look at safety, but you look at safety in a larger number of people. And then you also look at what's called immunogenicity, which is, is the body generating an immune response? If I vaccinate an individual and then take a blood sample, do I see antibodies in that sample? And then the third phase is even larger. So you're testing safety in a larger population again, so that um, you detect rarer, you have the ability to detect rarer and rarer events. And there what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I'm vaccinating a large number of people. I'm also tracking a large number of people. I'm not vaccinating. I'm letting them go about their daily lives over which time some subset of them will get infected. And then I'm looking at my vaccinated group and comparing it to my unvaccinating group and seeing what the difference in, in level of infection and sickness is. And then even after a vaccine is approved, you continue to monitor um, safety and efficacy through, through real world evidence, which is again, you know, trials, clinical trials, for example, um, cover tens of thousands of people, but then you look at, okay, when I give this to a million people, when I give this to a billion people, um, do I see any very rare safety issues as well as how do I better understand um, how the vaccines work by tracking who does and does not get sick in vaccinated and unvaccinated populations. Rita. Okay, hi, I was just wondering if you could tell us in what range can you expect the um, research and development phase for vaccines to cost? That, that's a great question. Um, 
typically hundreds of millions of dollars, if not um, billions of dollars. So if you look at, for example, the investments that uh, the US government made in vaccine development for COVID-19 vaccines to help encourage manufacturers to move faster and take on more risk. That was on the order of $10 billion. All right, well, thanks for all the great questions and um, please do keep them coming. Um, but maybe now I'll move on to the next section of my talk. So we talked a lot about how do you develop vaccines and how has that worked for COVID. Now let's talk about deployment. This is really, uh, in so many ways, this is an unprecedented time, but it's unprecedented in the vaccine field in the um, speed and scale of this vaccine rollout, where literally every country in the world is racing to vaccinate their populations um, as quickly as possible. And this is just a, a pull from a, a really useful site if anyone's interested in, in lots and lots of data on the topic of COVID-19 vaccination, our world in data is a great site um, to look at different countries and different metrics of progress. And this is just um, the latest data where you see countries proceeding um, at very different paces, both when they started and how quickly they've reached high levels of coverage of their population. Um, and what my colleagues and I have found really interesting as we've supported governments around the world to think about how do I do this rollout as quickly and as equitably as possible is that you can think about each of these little lines following um, a pretty consistent S-curve. I've been uh, very surprised at sort of how um, how robust this framework is for very different countries, where you can think about how countries roll out their vaccines in three main phases, where they face very different bottlenecks and therefore have to address very different challenges. So the first phase we've typically seen with, um, with vaccine rollout is that countries are supply constrained. Um, so these vaccines were developed very quickly the manufacturing capacity to then make billions of them has been developed very quickly. And right now we're still in a supply constrained environment. There aren't enough vaccines to vaccinate everyone in that world. That is starting to change quite quickly. I'll come back to that um, in a few minutes. But the first stage is countries are waiting. They're saying, when is my supply going to arrive? Particularly if they don't have domestic sources of supply. Um, and at this point in time, they're, they're trying to figure out how to get supply more quickly. And they're starting to build out their distribution infrastructure. The second phase is then when the supply does materialize, the problem very quickly shifts to throughput. And by throughput, what I mean is how quickly can you take the vaccines that you receive and put them into arms versus have them um, build up inventory on shelves. Um, this is where the US was, for example, in um, the early weeks of this year in January or even late December. Some of you might recall the headlines which said, you know, we have 20 million doses of vaccine, but we've only administered three or four million of them. And the reason for that is that um, the, the distribution infrastructure to vaccinate hundreds of millions of people um, just doesn't really exist. And so what very, each state had to do was think about how to very quickly uh, expand that infrastructure. And that included things like setting up mass vaccination sites. So you saw um, stadiums and parks being used to vaccinate. It also in included a lot of 
learnings about um, how to prioritize you know, who was eligible for a vaccine when and how to um, make sure that prioritization wasn't too rigid, but also wasn't too flexible. And so lots of different um, constraints. It also involved figuring out how to get more people to actually do the vaccinations, who was eligible, you know, nurses, doctors, other people you could train to administer. Uh, so lots of different constraints that had to be worked through. And then the third stage is we see countries reach a point where supply is plentiful, the infrastructure to administer vaccines is plentiful, um, but we reach a point where there isn't sufficient demand. There are subsets of the population that don't want to get vaccinated. Um, and so therefore you move from a supply constrained environment to a demand constrained environment. And then you've seen um, countries shift their strategies quite significantly. Like in the US, for example, moving from mass vaccination sites where when lots of people want to get vaccinated it's very efficient to say come to this big stadium and line up and get vaccinated when you're trying to reach people who um have a harder time you know, or have access challenges or have concerns you shift to saying how do we make this as easy for you as possible so that's things like um mobile clinics, it's things like much more use of pharmacies or doctor's offices or even, um, you know, grocery stores, state fairs, etc. So bring the vaccines to people rather than asking people to come to vaccines. Um, and then the final phase that countries are really just starting to enter or contemplate is what we call um, endemic transition. Right now we're in campaign mode. There's a push to um, really vaccinate the entire population as quickly as possible. One of the big open questions that we really just don't know the answer to is, are we going to need booster vaccines? Are we going to need to repeat vaccinate? And if that is the case, then uh, the approach needs to shift once again to think about um, you know, much more routine approaches like vaccination through doctor's offices or pharmacies like we do for annual flu vaccines. So I'm going to click a little bit more into each of those big bottlenecks. What are the big challenges that countries have been facing? First supply, then throughput and then demand to explain a little bit more about the nature of the challenge and then um, what can be done about it and what countries are doing about it. Um, so, so supply, what's really interesting about supply is that by the end of 2021, we will probably have enough supply to vaccinate the world. Um, the challenge is, what, and I'll come back to this in a little bit, but the main challenge is actually not that we don't have enough vaccines, but they're in the wrong places, that certain countries um, oversubscribed, so particularly wealthy countries, set, bought up um, more vaccines than they need for their population, which means other countries, and particularly poorer countries, don't have enough. Um, so it's not that by the end of 2021, we won't need more supply in aggregate, but we will need to think about redistribution and how to get supply to the parts of the world that need it the most. On throughput, this is a bit of a complex slide, but for maybe some of you who are interested in data science and advanced analytics, this is a place where, um, where advanced analytics can be really powerful in its application to drive public health impact. Um, so throughput, in order to get you know, vaccines into arms as quickly as possible, a really important part of that is your site network. What are the places where you're distributing vaccines? Where are they? How many vaccines can they administer per day? And how well do they reach their population? Um, so one of the teams that I lead at BCG is a team of data scientists that does a set of um, geoanalytics and optimization algorithms that help to answer these questions. Uh, so this is an example from a large US state we looked at 
where we looked at their site network and actually perhaps counterintuitively, what we found very quickly is their problem wasn't that they didn't have enough sites. Their problem was actually that they had too many. Um, so they had overbuilt their network and they built up about a thousand sites that were delivering vaccines. Um, but most of these sites weren't very helpful. They couldn't deliver, they couldn't administer many sites per day, uh, vaccines per day, and they were redundant. It's sort of like, you know, do you ever wonder why you have a Starbucks on one corner of the block and another Starbucks on another corner of the block? They were just too close to each other. And so they weren't actually that helpful, but there was a lot of cost and operational complexity in having so many sites. So what we were able to do is take um, their site location. So these little maps on the slide that you see, all the little yellow dots are sites where they're vaccinating and then evaluate how well they reach populations in the surrounding geography. Um, and, and again, what we found is that they reach sites quite well. So then what we did is we ran algorithms that said, okay, what if you take away sites? What if you take away these low value sites? Do you compromise on, um, on your reach of your surrounding populations? And where we didn't um, see a, a decrease in reach, we were able to recommend taking away those sites so they could focus on the 200 or so sites that were most valuable in terms of delivering vaccines uh, quickly and equitably uh, to the population of this state. And then on demand, demand is really, you know, I think what we see is throughput challenges are hard, but very solvable, you know, given time, given resources, given um, lots of people working at the problem, you can figure out things like how to optimize your uh, site network. Demand is a, is a tougher nut to crack. And that's where we are in the US right now um, is really at the point where uh, remaining vaccination coverage will have to come from, um, from combating challenges related to demand. Um, but there's a lot wrapped up in demand. And one of the first things that we can do is better understand uh, the different factors underneath demand almost in a differential diagnosis if you're like a, a doctor diagnosing a patient's problem um, and so this is another place where advanced analytics can be really helpful to first ask the question of okay where we see low uptake um, in a given geography is it because people are hesitant they don't want to get vaccinated or is it because they actually have access challenges, which is you know, the places near them where that are offering vaccines are only open during working hours and they can't take time off from work or they don't have a good way to get to them. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work that's been done by uh, various states across the US and the federal government to really think about where is there an access problem? Where is there a demand problem? And get very specific at individual zip code levels because it is highly variable. And this is a problem you have to solve very, very locally. Um, and so some of the levers, if you understand you have an access problem in your community, you can think about mobile outreach, you can think about free transportation, you can think about site hours, et cetera. Then if you're really trying to address hesitancy, Really, there are three main buckets of uh, solutions you can consider. One is trusted communications. How do you help get community leaders that are really trusted, equipped with the right messages on you know, why we believe vaccines are safe, why they're effective, why it's really important to get vaccinated? Um, and then there are carrots and sticks, so incentives. And, and you've probably seen lots of different experiments going on all over the US and, and really all over the world of everything from lotteries to free college tuition to free food to other perks to help encourage people to be vaccinated and then mandates. So rules around um, vaccination to attend school or college or to travel. Um, and, and what we see right now is just tremendous experimentation uh, to try to figure out the approaches that work best with um, different populations and to, to address different concerns. 
And so with that, let me stop again. First, we talked about more the research and development side. Um, now I've talked about, you know, how do you deliver these vaccines uh, really quickly at, at extremely high scale and some of the learnings and, and experimentation that's happening. Maybe before I pause, the one thing I'll say that I think gets underappreciated is um, the critical need for innovation in distribution as well as development. I think we we well appreciate that um, that vaccine development is risky and it may not work and you have to try different things and then there's a bit of an expectation that you know, once you get the vaccines they should be super easy to deliver but then actually in reality there's this whole other innovation agenda around addressing throughput challenges addressing um, demand challenges that is still very much active and where, again, I have a lot of optimism for everything we're learning that can be applied to vaccination more broadly and even to other um, public health challenges beyond vaccines. So let me pause there again and would love to hear what questions you might have. Vivian, go ahead. Oh, so my question is, um, why do countries purposely overbuy vaccines? That is a really great question. Um, so there are two reasons. One is when countries last year started purchasing vaccines, they didn't know which ones would work and they didn't know how many they would need. Um, so countries, started procuring vaccines or purchasing them before we had the clinical trial results um, that, that told us whether the vaccines would work or not. So what countries did is they would buy a portfolio. They said, I'll buy this many million of Pfizer and this many million of Moderna and this many million of J&J &J and this many million of AstraZeneca um, because you know it was actually I think a success beyond most people's expectations that actually all of those vaccines turned out to work, excuse me, but in the event that one or more of them didn't work, they still wanted to have enough vaccines to cover their population. So that was the main reason. And then the second reason is back to not knowing how many they would need. We still aren't sure you know, whether a booster dose is gonna be required for um, certain populations or even everyone come the fall and beyond. So there was also a question of, um, you know, potentially wanting to be prepared if, uh, you know, more than one course of vaccine was required. Tommy? Um, I would like to ask, I want to ask, um, what do you think about the political use of vaccines? Um, for instance, in Argentina, in certain parts, if you go to get the vaccine, um, it's like you get some um, some kind of a leaflet that um, with the image of the president, like that you should like making a political use of it because we have elections this year. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think you've, uh, you know, around the world, you see vaccination becoming very political in different ways, both you know, domestically as of the example in Argentina that you gave and also, you know, internationally, and I'll speak to this a bit more in a few minutes of you know, this, this concept of vaccine diplomacy, you know, countries giving vaccines and using it as a diplomatic tool to build relations with other countries. Um, and I guess the short answer is, you know, I, I wish that none of it existed. Um, you know, ideally we could, um, you know, we could vaccinate the world based on uh, epidemiology and uh, vaccine product profiles and with an eye to maximizing health impact and economic and social impact um, but the but the political realities are very much at play here, and um, you know I think it's important to acknowledge them and account for them, and you know try to 
still maximize sort of health objectives, economic objectives, and social objectives, um, you know, within the constraints of those political realities. Franco? Yes, well, this question is more related to the previous part of the presentation, but I hope you don't mind answering it. So I want to Any know questions if, are, are fair game. So I want to know if a vaccine could like uh, be approved and pass the three stage of investigation and uh, start being applied and then present side effects. I mean, let's say one year after it, can that happen? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I think the so so there there may be a couple ways to answer that. One is um, you know, on side effects and when we might see side effects. I think it's important to understand that clinical trials are um, you know, are designed to identify side effects that are common, but are not necessarily powered to uh, detect extremely rare events. Uh, because by definition, you know, if you test a vaccine in 30,000 people or 50,000 people or 100,000 people, you, you um, are powered to detect a one in 100,000 event, but you're not um, powered to detect a one in a million or a one in 100 million event. Um, and so that's what we've seen is as these vaccines have been rolled out around the world, there have been the identification of extremely rare side effects that, um, that weren't detected in the clinical trials because they are extremely rare and on the order of, you know, one in a million or, or even less. Um, so that part is to be expected and is no different than um, for COVID than it is for any other vaccine. And that's just the nature of back to the, the question that was asked on, you know, what are your methods for testing? You know, fundamentally, we, we do this empirically. Um, so, so you have to um, expose a large population to the vaccine and then, and then observe the results. Uh, in terms of if your question was sort of a time delay of a delayed reaction to a vaccine a year later or you know many years later, that's highly improbable. We don't see that um, with um, with other vaccines, and there's, um, to my knowledge, not a sort of strong biologic plausibility for that. Though there are questions that we don't know the answers to yet about sort of repeat vaccinations and what um, what the you know, reaction profile might be to a third dose or a fourth dose or, or a fifth dose, et cetera. Thank you. Corina. I was just wondering how the accessibility of vaccines has increased or how it could increase for countries who are unable to afford doses for their entire population. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So um, there are a couple of different ways to think about that. One is, um, one is how do we help countries who can't afford to purchase vaccines, to purchase vaccines. And the two main mechanisms that exist today for that are one through um, a partnership called COVAX, uh, which is um, led by the World Health Organization and other global health agencies um, that essentially raises money from rich countries, so donations, the US is a major contributor to COVAX as well as other high income countries. They, um, they raise money to then purchase vaccines from manufacturers on behalf of the poorest countries in the world, uh, recognizing that those countries won't be able to purchase those vaccines on their own. Um, and that builds on um, you know, sort of a very successful model that's been established for other vaccines to address this fundamental market failure, which is that you know, everyone in the world needs vaccines, but some countries don't have the resources to, um, to purchase them. 
And, and then the second mechanism is through uh, the development banks. So the World Bank and also regional development banks are making significant um, resources available to countries in the forms of different loans to loan them the money to purchase the vaccines themselves. So those are the two main levers sort of in the near term. The other approach that um, I think there'll be quite a lot of work on in the years to come, especially if we move into a world where we do need repeat seasonal vaccination against COVID is also ways to think about bringing down the cost of the vaccines. And that can be done both through market forces. So introducing more supply and more manufacturers and, and the competition that that creates. It can also be done by things like dose, dose sparing. So you know, can you actually use um, a, a smaller dose or a single dose of the vaccine, which sort of brings down the cost of uh, the vaccine itself. Um, so lots of different kind of angles on this, all of which uh, it's not one or the other, it's sort of an and and an and and an and of approach uh, for both the short term and the long term. Adam. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if there was, not like, shoot. I was wondering if there was a way um, to maybe not, to like put vaccine distribution under the control, not the complete control, but like partial control of some sort of international, maybe UN based health committee. I mean, I see that from the Karina's question already kind of answered one of the ways is COVAX, but I was wondering if there's a way for the UN or the WHO, for example, to kind of set aside some vaccine doses um, that are being produced, maybe uh, requisition them for uh, poor countries. Like, would that help unequal distribution? Yeah, so and and that thanks for that question, um, because it, it sort of leads me uh, nicely to some of what I'll talk about in, in kind of the final chapter of my presentation. Um, but, but, yes, I think the um, in terms of supply, um, there may be three different things to think about. One is uh, the COVAX mechanism, which is one way to get supply to countries. Um, that mechanism, I think, will ultimately prove quite successful. It has struggled um, in the past months uh, because of the massive outbreak in India. And what has happened is uh, COVAX expected to get most of its supply um, particularly over the past couple of months from the Serum Institute of India, which is a manufacturer based in India. Um, when India um, had its devastating outbreak starting in early April, it closed, it, it restricted exports of any vaccine from India because it wanted to make sure all that supply could be used domestically. And what that meant was the supply that was supposed to go to lots of other places in the world um, couldn't go there. And so a, a really important lesson learned there, I think in terms of diversification of supplier base as we think about future pandemic preparedness. So there was the original COVAX solution. There's now, and I'll talk about it a bit more in a second, but this effort for um, high income countries who have excess doses to donate them to uh, other parts of the world is, is sort of our best lever in, in the near term. And then longer term, which isn't so much gonna help us for this pandemic, because as I was showing you some of the data, by the end of this year, we'll have enough supply. Um, but in the future, there are lots of questions that are starting to be asked and, and desperately need answers in terms of um, a more resilient manufacturing network that, for example, um, diversifies suppliers so they're not concentrated in a few countries like India, 
Um, also, you know, there's sort of a glaring gap. If you look at where vaccines are manufactured today, um, very few are vaccinated or are located on the African continent, um, which is, is the furthest behind on its uh, vaccine rollouts uh, because of that. So there's um, a lot of conversation now happening about what is that network of the future that allows countries to be more prepared, but that's not going to help with the current rollout, but it's super important for preparation for future um, future potential pandemic or epidemic situations. Um, since your question led so perfectly into your next slides, I'll go ahead and put the people who have asked questions first on the list, and then you can just go ahead and continue. Okay, great. Um, I have just a couple of slides left. And then I think Brian said um, you wanted to be done around 920. So that should hopefully leave us uh, time for one more round of questions. Um, so let's talk about, okay, we've talked about how the vaccines got developed, the research and development agenda. We've talked about distribution and the different challenges countries face. This is a slide that um, my colleagues and I put together to try to take a step back and say, okay, if we think about how these rollouts are going in different countries around the world, how do we think about different archetypes? How do we think about, um, you know, when will we be done? When will we reach those high levels of vaccination coverage? And you can think about countries in five different groups broadly. One is what we call the rollout leaders, which is countries like the US, the UK, Chile, Israel, um, who very quickly secured their supply early, figured out their administration infrastructure pretty quickly and made um, great progress in, in quite rapid time. Um, there's a second set of countries, also high income countries, uh, Europe, Canada, many countries in Europe, Canada, who um, for various reasons were a bit slower to secure supply um, and a bit slower to administer, but are now catching up very quickly. Um, and we expect them to, you know, we're already starting to see them reach high levels of vaccination coverage and, and, and they should be um, you know, at, at high levels this quarter. Um, the third set of countries is a really interesting one that's largely countries in uh, East Asia and the Pacific, which were a lot of island nations in particular that were actually some of the most successful at containing the virus before we had vaccines. So through strategies like testing and contact tracing and border closures. So Australia, New Zealand, Korea, um, and they actually became victims of their own success, which is because they were so successful in containing the virus without vaccines, they actually felt very little urgency to move quickly with vaccines in stark contrast to say the US or the UK, which had terrible waves of the epidemic, you know, last fall and into the winter and therefore felt an extreme sense of urgency. And so these countries have been slower to um, to vaccinate and are now really suffering as they face the Delta variant, which is uh, undermining their ability to control without vaccination. Australia in particular has been in the news a lot, um, as has Japan uh, with the Olympics just starting. Uh, so surprisingly low vaccination rates, especially given how well they responded to COVID um, last year. The fourth category is um, what we call leading low and middle income countries. These are typically larger um, middle income countries that do have domestic sources of supply, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, India. These are all countries that um, produce vaccines domestically. So they don't have as many challenges with that supply constraint, but they are large countries with relatively weaker healthcare, public health systems, and therefore they face a lot of throughput challenges. So actually administering the supply that they do have is um, going slowly. And we would expect those campaigns um, to, to need to continue probably through the first half of next year. And then finally, we have the 
what we call the supply starved low and middle income countries, um, which are especially concentrated in Africa. So you can see on the left hand side of the map, this is all the red countries um, where this is these are the countries we really need to help with that last discussion we were just having of how do you help these countries um, secure supply, pay for supply, get it through donations so that they can really um, increase their ability to administer vaccines. And then longer term, think about how do we uh, have more manufacturing capacity on the African continent so they can look more like those leading lower middle income countries that have domestic sources of supply. Um, so big picture, you know, right now, um, you know, forecasting timelines is, is a really dangerous business, I think in COVID times, but big picture, um, those first four categories, we can say, look, you know, we think we'd be in a position to get to high levels of vaccination coverage um, by the, the first half of next year. But that category five, if we don't change that picture, we're gonna have the pandemic continuing in some parts of the world, even, through some forecasts, we'll say through 2024. Um, so there's there's a really urgent agenda on how do we help those countries in the red to look more like the countries in the green. And this just, you know, I think it's it's easy to look at charts and statistics, and and I just bring this page in to really bring into life what. Uh, you know, complete moral failure this is, frankly, um, for for the world. As you see, you know, it was really brought into stark relief in mid-April when you saw on the one hand, the US really hit that demand bottleneck where there were lots and lots of doses of vaccines, but people didn't want them anymore. And so you see mass vaccination sites like the picture on the left where lots of seats, lots of available vaccines, um, but no one there to take them. Um, and then at the same time, on the other side of the world, you see in India, just a massive uncontrolled outbreak um, and really uh, that overwhelms the healthcare infrastructure and quite insufficient supply of vaccines to be able to protect the population. So how do we change this picture? Um, this is my final slide and, and parting thoughts. Really in the near term, there is a, a really important opportunity in redistribution. Um, as, as your questions already led me to, um, there are a lot of numbers on this chart, but basically what this is showing in a quantitative form is some of what I've already been speaking to about high income countries purchasing way more vaccine than they need. Um, so the way, to, to look at this is to the, the dark green bars. So the blue bar is sort of how much vaccine is needed to cover the population in the country. The white bar is sort of, okay, how much, if you think you need an extra booster dose, how much additional might you need? And then the green is pure excess. So if you add up you know, the United States, the European Union, the UK, Canada, Australia, some of the wealthiest countries in the world, you basically get to about 5 billion doses of excess vaccines. So if we can figure out how to move those vaccines from high income countries to those supply starved red countries um, at, at, from the previous slide, we'll be in a much, much better place in terms of accelerating vaccine rollout um, and having a path to really ending this pandemic um, in the first half of 2022 versus waiting until as long as 2024.